Hello, and thank you for joining me today. My name is Nisa Winters, and I am a senior research scientist for Conservation X Labs, and I have been working as a geneticist for wildlife conservation for about eight years. And this is a project I'm really excited to talk to you about. Uh, Minding the gap, bolstering access to voucher specimens of threatened species opens up applications for conservation technology. So we're going to be talking a lot about voucher specimens, uh, DNA barcodes, and why those might be important for some conservation applications. So we know that genetic applications can be used in all sorts of ways, and more and more genetics is becoming a gold standard for how we ask and answer certain questions. You know, we can look at entire ecosystems and their interactions, predator-prey relationships. We can look for diseases. We can search for invasives, you know, with eDNA. Uh, we can determine whether a species is illegal or legal to trade. So all of these things have really scalable effects if we can use genetics to support them. So in order to make those genetic applications really, really useful, we need voucher specimens. And yes, we can definitely use non-voucher specimens in a lot of these cases. But for certain questions that we want to ask, especially you know talking about illegal trade or talking about endangered species, we really need a voucher specimen to refer to. We need reference data. We need to understand the haplotypes, the genetic variability, we need to understand geographic distribution and changes of allele frequencies across those. So voucher specimens are really important because they're going to point to that taxonomic identification. They're going to reduce error. They're going to point to reliability um, if we create assays that are asking certain questions. And really importantly, too, voucher specimens have access to metadata uh, and also access to, in some cases, the field scientists who collected them. So there's just a lot more opportunity to ensure that you have reliability when creating species identification, species identification assays for these types of um, questions. This figure was taken from Buckner et al., which came out earlier this year, and it displays the percentage of vouchered versus non-vouchered vertebrate genomes available on NCBI. And as you can see, there's a dis disproportionate amount of vouchered uh, references available. And this is really surprising, especially for species like mammals, where we have a lot of accessibility to many of these species. And so, you know, it kind of is pointing towards a trend that, you know, a lot of times we are going to reference and sequence a species, but we aren't necessarily going to take the extra time to make sure it's vouchered. And this is going to have some long-term effects if we don't start pointing this in the opposite direction. So what do these voucher barcodes have to do with conservation technology? Well, we've been working on a product called the NABIT, and you can learn more about it in David Bache's talk under Conservation Genomics Session 2. And this device is meant to be field-ready, affordable, and accessible to any type of species identification assay that can help with those applications I mentioned earlier, you know, wildlife trade, seafood fraud, et cetera. Uh, but in order to make those assays, you know, we need a good representation of species diversity. We need to understand their range. We need to understand non targets versus targets. We need to understand species that are related that might pop up. You know, we have to ensure that we have good reliability and reproducibility. And specifically, you know, we want to use this for threatened species. So this begs the question, you know, do we have adequate genetic availability in order to do that? So this led to the formation of a big data set, and you can learn more about that in Madeline Burbeek's talk, which is also in the same session. So this data set is actually the combination of public domain information that's available from Barcode of Life, the IUCN, the CITES appendices, the Edge of Existence, as well as NCBI. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, we're really going to emphasize the use of BOLD and the voucher genetic data, along with the IUCN red listing. And then I'm also going to sprinkle in some of these rankings of CITES and EDGE, since they have some policy structures as well as some really good rankings to point to species that are at the risk of extinction. And this is going to help answer some of these questions. The biggest question asked first is how big are the genetic gaps? And genetic gap meaning the distribution of genetic availability across a huge array of species. So rather than look at all species, we're going to look at a subset here, which includes mammals, birds, amphibians, and reptiles, or tetrapods. Uh, and to look at, you know, at risk of extinction and future risk of extinction, we took species that had critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, and data deficient red list statuses. And we also included any near-threatened and least concerned species that had decreasing or unknown populations, because that means they're probably on the pathway to extinction. And then for genetic availability, we looked at cytochrome oxidase subunit 1, since this is the 
uh, accepted barcoding gene for these species. And we also restricted the genetic length to be larger than 400 base pairs, just because that's more useful for genetic assessment. So we have a couple of hypotheses here, which we are going to test as we go through the results. So the first bit of results here is just going to look at all tetrapods together, uh, not looking at class. So we're going to look at this table down here on the left first, which is just showing red list status against the number of barcodes and the number of species uh, within each status. So this is over 21,000 species, and they had over 48,000 barcodes available. So that only amounts to less than three barcodes on average per species. So if we look at the number of barcodes available by species, um, we're saying that over 65% of species have no genetic barcode availability, and um, you know a, a variable proportion have one to 30 barcodes, and then less than 2% have over 30 barcodes. And the reason for the 30 barcode cutoff is just that when you're thinking about um, species and geographic distribution, their haplotype diversity, we're making an assumption that over 30 barcodes is gonna be necessary to really represent that species. Uh, and again, this could be supplemented with non-vouchered uh, you know, sequences, but it was pretty surprising to see how extreme this gap is. So we're just going to break down the data a little further here on this slide by including the actual classes instead of grouping it all together. And this is to try to test our hypotheses a little bit about the charismatic species. And it definitely is true that we see, you know, better proportions between zero barcodes and some barcodes with mammalia. And that is also true with AVs, especially in the least concern. Um, and then there's just a general trend in the way of, you know, these more charismatic species, these less rare species, they're gonna have a little bit more genetic coverage, but that is relatively marginal. It's, it's really only a difference of about 1%. So let's look at the data here in terms of CITES. So we have the three appendices here um, and we have our distribution by class. Um, the good news is that there's a little bit less <laughs> species here that have zero barcodes available. You know, the majority of species actually have some barcodes available, but still, you know, it's the same issue where over 98% are going to have less than 30. But at least we're moving in the right direction, the positive direction. Um, and this is particularly important because a lot of CITES species are going to be great candidates for conservation genetic applications in the legal wildlife and timber trafficking. Uh, so, and that's really important too, because if we can bolster the, the reference data for these species, you know, they're going to be high profile, they're related to policy, if we can bolster their genetic availability, then we can actually create genetic tools to help monitor the illegal trade. And this is just looking at the same type of information a different way. So this I actually expanded to include all Appendix 1 listed species. So this goes beyond just tetrapoda, um, and, but you can see here that tetrapods have the majority of genetic availability in reference to all CITES species. And again, this isn't unexpected, um, but it does point to that similar issue that we know we have, you know, these smaller organisms, these less well-known organisms, they are just not as represented in our genetic databases. So this slide is gonna show the distribution of genetic coverage for edge-listed species. And since EDGE combines evolutionary distinctiveness with uh, status listing, you know, the vast majority of species are going to be in that critically endangered to vulnerable status. Um, but it's back to that trend where the vast majority of species have zero barcodes, very little coverage. Uh, and these creatures, these species represented in the EDGE listing, they're very unique, they're rare, they have, you know, a genetic divergence that is special. And in some cases, there's just not a lot of research effort into these species. And so it would be really, really amazing to bolster the vouchered availability for these species so that we can do more to preserve these rare and amazing animals. So this last bit of result data I wanted to show you here is an actual list of species. And what we're doing here is we're combining a set of species that are CITES listed and have edge ranking along with some barcode availability, which is hopefully sufficient for some conservation genetic applications against a list of species that don't have any barcode coverage. And obviously these lists extend farther than the 18 that are showcased here. These are just examples that were pulled. And what we're trying to showcase here is, you know, on the left, almost all species here are mammals. There's just three reptiles represented, you know, versus on the right, you know, we have more tetrapods represented, some amphibians, some birds. 
and it's pointing back to the issue of the charismatic species and it's pointing back to the issue of like you know we're not looking at this data altogether you know yes you can look at the IUCN red listing yes you can look at CITES but when you look at edge as well and you start mapping that with maybe the threat data that comes from IUCN as well as the genetic coverage you get these much larger pictures about okay what species still need our help and which ones can we apply some kind of applications to provide impact to the preservation of that species? So this is just an example of a type of list that we can pull from these data sets and use to help prevent extinction in the future. I just spent a lot of time pointing at the problem, which is that we have this big gap. So let's start looking at the solution. You know, I think that there's a lot of missed opportunities. There's a lot of things that are right in front of us that are usable as voucher specimens. You know, maybe there's already databases sitting around that are just not part of the public domain. You know, we have these sanctuaries organizations that have access to a lot of these samples, these rare, these endangered species that need supplementation in voucher repositories. So let's engage with each other. Let's think about community. Let's have these conversations. There's got to be a way that we can prioritize voucher specimens because of the benefit that they could bring to conservation applications into the future. So my question to you, the audience, and I hope you will bring this to the question and answer session that we will have, is what are the biggest challenges to closing the genetic sequencing gaps and how do we overcome them? Lastly, I just want to say thank you to Madeline Verbeek and Rachel Martin for all their contributions to this project, as well as my team for all their support. And feel free to look me up at any of these links down below if you have any questions or comments and to check out what Conservation X Labs is up to. Thank you so much.